ended off by talking about a story of a father who brought his son into the kitchen and uh, illustrated the boiling of three basic things. One, carrots, eggs, and coffee bean. So when he boiled the carrots and then he uh, spoke to his son, are you the carrot that seems hard at first, but with the smallest amount of pain and this subjected to heat and boiling water or adversity in our lives, um, you become soft with no strength. And then he boiled the egg and then he said, are you like an egg, which initially starts with a malleable heart, a fluid spirit, a soft, gentle heart, and then maybe subjected to, for example, challenges in life, maybe a death, a breakup, or an accident, you become hardened and stiff. Your shell looks the same, but you are so bitter and tough that everything around you, um, you, know, you don't feel anything anymore. <coughs> or the third, are you like the coffee bean? The bean does not get its best flavor and robustness until it reaches 100 degrees Celsius. So the, the more the water gets hotter, the more the bean gets, uh, you know, gets uh, brewed better. So in life, then he asked his son, when things are seemingly worse, do you get better? Or when people talk uh, most about you at your back, does your honor increases? And when the hour is the darkest, does your worship elevates you to another level? So he asked, and now I ask out myself and, and you, how do you handle adversity and challenges in life? Will you become the carrot? You become soft at the end of it? Or do you become an egg? You become hardened? Or do you become a coffee bean, which then gives the full-bodied flavor of a nice cup of coffee? So that is one of the objectives in which we study in Tasawwur Islam, knowing how we exist and our rights and responsibilities as a Muslim by ourselves, and also to juxtapose that positioning with regards to how we act and behave and who we are as Muslims in the big picture. So Tasawwur gives you a worldview perspective with regards to how you exist. So for the last few months, we, uh, we did our revision last week. We talked about the Muslim and, and his Lord and how he builds his relationship. So today we're going to embark on a new topic, which is how a Muslim develops his relationship with his soul in order for him to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to begin by talking about a quotation uh, from this book called The 40 Rules of Love, written by Ali Shafa, a Turkish writer, which talks about the relationship between Maulana Rumi and his teacher Shams at Tabriz. And in, it, in rule number 10, she said, East, West, South or North makes little difference. No matter what and where your destination is, just be sure to make every journey a journey within. So it doesn't matter whether East, West, North or South, but whatever journey you embark, make sure that first and foremost is a journey within, in your heart. And if you travel within, you will travel the whole wide world and beyond. Because in order for you to know, your, to know Allah, you have to know yourself. In order for you to be able to overcome our weaknesses, for example, our anger, our impatience, our jealousy, our need to seek revenge, for example, or whatever that may be, that must be controlled and that can only be controlled from within. Right? Because otherwise we blame everything on the external environment, but we do nothing within and we still will not have the strength to overcome those challenges. So with regards to the soul, so today we're talking about the soul and so the, the question is what is the soul? And in Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ عَوْضُ اللَّهِ مِنَا شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ And they ask you, Ya Muhammad, what is this thing called ruh or the spirit? And then Allah says, كُلِّ رُوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Say, the soul is the affair of my Lord. Right? And وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And mankind have not been given much knowledge of it except for just a little. So we want to talk about the purification of the soul in order for us to be able to control our actions, our desires, and the way that we react. And the way that we, we put our perspective in a right way so that we don't get too much affected by what other people do to us. We must go inside within ourselves. So what is that within ourselves? And the, ask, and the question is, what is the roh? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked to relate to us that what is about the roh that we know of is only minuscule, it's just a little. However, the soul is the affair or something that is the matter that is the responsibility of, of Allah. So, in, and then there are also other verses in the Quran that then explains to us a little bit about what this role consists or what is the nature or characteristics of our role. And in Surah Yusuf, chapter 12, verse 53, 
Allah says, "Wa ma ubarriun nafsi," and I do not acquit myself, and I do not put myself as blame blameless. Inna nafsa la ammaratum bisu. Indeed, the soul is persistently going towards or is uh, attracted towards something that's of evil, yeah, of of negative things. Uh, bisu. Illa ma rahima Rabbi. However, except those souls upon whom Allah has given mercy, and this is really beautiful because if by nature our soul, our, our roh, and our soul is always inclined towards performing something that is forbidden, right? I mean, it's it's clear whenever we talk about, for example, the forbidden fruit. And the story of maybe Nabi Adam alayhi salam is talking. Allah says, "You can have everything except la takraba hadhi shajara. Do not go near the tree." Not only to not eat the tree, but of all the millions and millions of possibilities of fruits and food to consume, he decided to consume and go near the tree and then consume the, the fruit, right? And so in life, sometimes something that is forbidden becomes something that is attractive because it's a challenge. So we sometimes gear ourselves towards that. So this is what Allah is talking about: the nafs or the soul is always inclined towards performing something that's evil. However, there's a caveat. He says, um, "Illa ma rahima Rabbi." However, the soul whom Allah has given mercy will be the exception. So, in order to protect our soul, our, our role, our roh, or our soul, from performing something or towards inclined towards doing something that is negative, then first and foremost, in this verse, we must be able to be a person or a roh who then invites the mercy of Allah to protect ourselves. Right? And so, how do we do this? One of the ways is to be that Muslim that we want to be. And in the beginning of this book, when talking about the Adil Muslim, he talks about one of our, one one is to be an honest human being. That you want to be on the path of Allah, you need to be honest about things to yourself, to other people, uh, to uh, you know, to Allah, right? And number two is to be the walking Quran. Whatever small that we read about the verses of the Quran, the important imperative thing that we need to do as a Muslim would be in order for on the day of judgment that the Quran can be an intercession for us. That small things that we learn, we apply them to life, and so these are the two main uh, main things that that he talk about in the book. So how, to draw the mercy of the rahmah of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is to be able to drive our soul from that hardened spirit to something that is compassionate, something that is loving, something that is merciful, and one of the ways to do this is to make it soft through zikrullah. And the basic zikr, the understanding of zikr that the Prophet ﷺ has defined for us would be one through our prayers. Prayers is a zikrullah. Prayers is not simply a ritualistic worship that we perform because it is something that we do. Prayer is something that we do because it is part of the big picture of what we call zikrullah. In order for this zikr, this remembrance, this constancy, this connection with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala brings us to a state. In which we will always be reminded through the zikrullah remembrance that acts as a guidance and protection that we reach the level of taqwa, because that is the bottom line in which Allah decides between one of us and the other. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum. So the element of taqwa, so prayer as a as a sense of zikr is one of the basket of deeds that we perform in order to reach that state in which we can arrive to taqwa. And this could be the fasting because it is also a zikrullah. Reading the Quran is a zikrullah. Every alphabet is rewarded, and every one reward is given a minimum of ten times that reward. So all of this leads us to the state of zikrullah. And when our hearts are always inclined towards thinking about Allah or relating to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we will see something that is fahsha and munkar, right? something that is sinful. Naturally, because the heart is already in a state of connection, and we are conscious that Allah is with us, that we are carrying Allah with us. So the choice that we make, although maybe we don't even know what is the hukum and hakam of this particular deed, <coughs> right? We are as Muslims, you are kind of obsessed with what is halal and haram, isn't it? I mean, we go to a restaurant. Is this permissible? Can I eat this? And the best way, if let's say you do not know about the ruling, would be to then ask your heart, ask your soul, how do I feel about? This restaurant, for example, this food, because the hadith in uh, the collection of Imam Nawawi, hadith number twenty-seven, if not mistaken, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is narrated by Imam Muslim, righteousness is what your heart feels comfortable and at peace with, and sins is what your heart flutters and moves to and fro, and it is uncomfortable with the doing of that act. 
You understand what I mean? Because that is when Allah talks about in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّقُوا وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ اللَّهُ Be God conscious, be pious, then we will then inspire and guide and protect you. Because sometimes you're put in a situation, we don't know what the ruling of certain things are. Right? So what do we do? We know the basic, but this sounds like it, this sounds not like it. I mean, you're not going to have the, you know, the, the privilege of calling any ustaz all the time. Right? So what does your heart think when you want to do that certain thing of eat that kind of food? Does your heart stay at peace or does it flutter to and fro and it becomes a source of discomfort? When that happens, then avoid it. Although, and the hadith was beautiful, if you read the hadith, it's hadith number 37, I'm sure. Although, the Prophet said, it has been declared as halal by scholars. That is what the hadith says, mashallah. So there's always this encouragement for us to be in a state of relationship and communication with our roh, with our soul. And this soul therefore must be prepared when that event comes, when we need to consult it. So at every moment, we must be in a conscious state of always being in a state of zikullah, so that with that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that becomes a sense of guidance, that becomes a sense of protection for what we need from Him. Right? So, in another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said with regards to the soul, <coughs> the souls are like constricted, constricted soldiers. That means like NS. You know, constricted means compulsory service. Souls are like soldiers who have to do this compulsorily. Get my translation. And then the Prophet continue. Those whom they recognize, they get along with. And those whom they do not recognize, they will never get along with. So one is that you need to then develop for your own self, your individual personal relationship with regards to your soul. And then this soul must always be attached and always be in companies of people who are also trying to purify the soul. Because when souls know each other, who are in this path of purification, know each other, they get along. Right? Sometimes you don't understand, you, you meet a new person and you just like click. What does it mean? How do you explain that? From an Islamic position, it is with regards to the roh. Where the roh is speaking to each other, there's a lot of commonalities and they're all struggling the same path, walking towards the same, struggling, wanting to be this best servant of Allah, purifying their own soul. And when it doesn't click, maybe you are more interested in purifying your soul. This other person is not even thinking about purifying your soul. Just living and floating life as the day passes by. So it doesn't click. So like, even if you try to, com to converse, even if you work in the same organization and there's a lot of things to talk about, you cannot click. Yeah, this is the beauty in which Allah naturally by fitrah puts us together. So there's a few things that we can conclude from these several verses of the, had of the hadith and from the Quran with regards to the soul. One, in order for us to develop and to possess a soul that is pure, a soul that is rigorous in its path and journey towards reaching Allah, it is a choice. It is a physical, intellectual, mental choice that we all have to make in order for us to make sure that the role is on that path. And because of all things, this will be a question of us on the Day of Judgment. And that's why it needs to be a conscious choice that we make. Right? Two, that because it is a choice, it, is, it requires a freedom in which you are able to choose or you are not and it is really up to you. And so Allah brought us up in a sense of fitrah that we um, accept that there is a concept of God as a sense of our natural disposition, our fitrah. So we accept as when we are born that, well, there is a God. But our life throughout is to discover that indeed we want not only to know that there is a God, that we become convinced that definitely there is a God because clearly the evidences are all around. Whether it is from your own existence or whether you look at nature, whether you look at His creations, whether you contemplate about His 99 Asma'ul Husna with regards to how He manifests, manage and create His creation. I mean, mashallah, I mean, just one example would be that your ability to be here. Not many people can have this one hour of, you know, uh, of, you know, a time where they can perform Jum'ah and have the privilege of just sitting here for a couple of minutes before going back to the office. But we do. And this becomes one of the way in which we can see how Allah's mercy and Allah's compassion is upon us that we are given this opportunity for today and there are many others out there who wanted to but cannot. And so what do we do? After our prayers, we say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we perform sujud shukur. We become more humble because of the many creations of Allah. We are one of those whom He chose to pray Jama'ah in His noble house today. 
because tomorrow might be a different story. You see this, right? So there is, you know, some, you know, one of the aspects of trying to have a pure heart is to not be proud because the concept of takabur is a characteristic of the iblis. And on Wednesday we talk about the Sirah stories of prophets. We mentioned this quite a bit. So arrogance, uh, the word used in the Quran is takabur. And sometimes when we ask ourselves why, for what reason do you have to be proud? When everything that you are, when everything that you have, when everything that you gain is only from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even when we talk about this surah, something that we cannot see, right? In Surah Yusuf, just now we say that all of us, the inclination of our souls is la uh, ammaratu bisu and then illa ma rahima rabbi, except for those souls in which Allah has bestowed mercy. That even when you are pure, when even you're pious, or for example, even you're God conscious, it's not because of you. It is only our efforts, our choices that we make to then put this effort that it might not even turn out to be a pious man uh, despite praying 1,000 times. But some people, maybe, they just perform the five daily prayers. No sunnah, no ba'dian, no kabdian, no tahajud. But maybe that prayer was so present, was so of a quality that then Allah bestows, showers him with his mercy. And I'll give you an example as a closing for today. In the past, there is a Bedouin, and this is narrated in, in Sahih uh, Bukhari and Muslim. There was a Bedouin man, not sophisticated intellectual graduates like all of us, a Bedouin man who doesn't know how to read or, or write. And at that time, you must know that in Sirah it was narrated, there was less than 15 people who knew how to read and write in Makkah. And Sayyidina Umar was one of them, and the Prophet وسلم, wasn't one of them. So that was the kind of sophistication they have, or the lack of it. So this Bedouin man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the last day? And the Prophet ignored him. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the last day? And the Prophet ignored him again. And the third time he said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the last day? Instead of asking, answering that question, the Prophet then said, What if it is tomorrow? What have you done for it? Right, what have you done for it? And this becomes the disease of a lot of, uh, kind of, a lot of youngsters nowadays. Like very obsessed with these signs of the last days. Whereas, you know, I mean, we know that the days are near. And, but the point is, if the signs, the major signs are out, that means it's over. So why worry and then do nothing about it? Instead, do a lot about it and then let the signs come when Allah wills it to come. Okay, so then he responded by saying, the Bedouin, well, I didn't do much. I just do the fardu prayer, no, no sunnah. I do the fardu fasting, no sunnah. You know, uh, the zakat, and, you know, that's the basic requirement. However, I love Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's a ba- he does basic stuff, nothing extra, but he says, I love Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet's reply to this was simply, Al-Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab, that you will be with the one whom you love. So if you clearly declare and honestly, sincerely say that you love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and me, then you will be with me. So this Bedouin, very simple person, was happy because like, mashallah, I love the Prophet, I'm good. And he walked away. Of course, if the person who asked this is a, is a scholar or an ustaz or a mufti, of course the Prophet won't answer this way. Lah, you know? This is for a Bedouin, simple guy. And so we think about it, and the reason, the only reason why the Prophet said this, he didn't say, why don't you do the sunnah? Why didn't you read the Quran? Why didn't, when do you fast Monday, Thursday? That sort of thing. He didn't. So this guy go back thinking that I have a chance to be with the, with the Prophet in Jannah. But because if he begin to truly understand what it means to love the Prophet, then he will then slowly begin to understand, well, the Prophet wake up for tahajjud, the Prophet fast, you know, nawafil. So if he does that, in a, in a, if I claim to love him, and eventually I will develop these practices that I will follow his example because Allah says in the Quran, Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana. For verily in the person of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the most beautiful pattern of conduct. And of course the implicit understanding of this is for us to follow. And because the Prophet gave him hope when he leaves by saying you are going to paradise, he's happy. And so he will develop slowly bit by bit and inshallah, through his deeds and his piety, will eventually meet Allah, I meet the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah. But imagine, like some kind of some of the advices that we give, and you know, if this guy says, "I only do the fardu, I don't do the sunnah, I don't believe in the sunnah," we will say, 
how can you be in paradise if you don't do the sunnah? Right? And if I go home and someone tells me I don't have a chance to be in paradise, then I will not even put any effort because there's no hope in this faith. And Islam came and the message of Islam is about hope. And that's why it did not put Islam in this generation where there's a lot of Muslims. It was put in Mecca when every, most of them were pagans. Most of them were, were Jews or Christians who have started to worship idol and forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Allah leaves them and gives them hope by reminding them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that their deeds will be directed towards Allah. And so as his Khalifa, this is our role to give others the hope that they need. Do not belittle the small conversations. Maybe your son asks you, your friend asks you, hey, where, where are you going? Prayer. In Unila, you know, let's go and makana, you know. And you said something, just a sentence, a beautiful message of why you need to come here. And maybe that becomes a, an investment that you plant, a seed that you plant that, wallahu alam, maybe in, you know, one week, one month, one year maybe, when it is being watered, maybe by him, by someone else, by the video that he watched. That, that will grow and he will start to join you to perform the Jama'ah next month, inshallah. Okay? So remember who we are, what we are, and this is how we establish our relationship. We need to know why we are here so that we can perform our role. And in this month, we're going to talk about our relationship with Allah with regards to the spirit, the roh that controls us, the nafs. So next week, inshallah, we'll talk about how then do we go on, the, what are the things that we can do to purify this roh, to purify this soul, so that this soul can then galvanize the physical to perform the good deeds, inshallah. But in the meantime, if you are free on Wednesday, join me again for the kuliah on the sirah of the prophets. And we are going to be talking about sirah of Nabi Ayub, inshallah, in this Wednesday. So let's close this session by reciting Tasbih Kafara and Surah Al-Asr. Inshallah, I'll see you again. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu ala ilaha ila anta. Nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سلكوا العزيم سيوجنوا منزه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.